Okay, this week I'm going to introduce you to four photographers, um, and we are going to continue with this theme of photojournalism as art. And uh, this first artist, Walker Evans, is probably one of the most famous American photographers of the 20th century. So Walker Evans was born in St. Louis, Missouri in 1903, and he painted as a child, and he took photographs with a small Kodak camera. He attended one year of college before he quit, and he moved to New York, where he worked in bookstores and at the New York Public Library. He wanted to be a writer, and he spent a year in Paris in 1927 before he returned to New York um, with the intentions of making a career as a writer, but he also began taking photographs more seriously. And his, his photographs bring literary strategies um, into their composition, such as lyricism and irony and narrative. In 1935, he accepted a job with the US Department of the Interior. So he was a government employee and his job was to photograph coal miners in West Virginia. And then this job, which was temporary, led him to a full-time position with the New Deal's Farm Securities Administration, where he was assigned to travel um, to the Midwest and the West to document the depression and its effects on rural America. So these are some of the most, America's most famous photographs. Um, in 1938, the Museum of Modern Art opened a rep retrospective. So the photographs were not only, um, they were not only used in a kind of uh, official government, for official government purposes, but they were also then recognized as art and you'll see why. Um, so MoMA again opens a retrospective of his work and publishes the accompanying monograph called American Photographs. So this is one of those photographs from his, uh, from his series. Um, and this is Alabama cotton farmer, cotton tenant farmer's wife, 1936. So Walker Evans, even though he was charged, you know, his employment was to document the effects of the depression, he did so with a kind of, uh, with a sense of humanism. And so he was really interested in the subjects that he was taking their photo as he was taking their photographs. So it was not only meant to document the kind of economic or political effects of the depression, but really the human toll that the depression took on Americans across across the West and particularly you know, in Oklahoma. This is a sharecropper's family, Hale County, Alabama, March 1936. So if we really look at this photograph, you know, he's documented this family in an incredibly uh, and, and really captured um, the kind of economic, the, the, the real economic situation that they're in with, um, while also kind of maintaining a sense of dignity about the, the, the people that he's photographing. Uh, even though we have, you know, this little boy who doesn't have diapers, right? Or the family can't afford shoes on, on most of them. Um, they're still, uh, he still, you know, maintains a sense of dignity of his subjects. Again, we have this kind of direct gaze, which is incredibly powerful for the photographic subject to be looking directly at the camera and then directly kind of like through us through time. It's almost as if he's documented, he's documenting the past in his photographs, even though he was obviously photographing in the present, he had, he had that in mind to really be, um, to really be documenting uh, a particularly, you know, important moment in time. And so he had that, the, the gravity of that on his shoulders and so he created compositions and, and took photographs that uh, really are representational of the Great Depression. They become photographs that really embody the Great Depression in a lot of ways. And then he also, you know, took some landscape shots too. So he would take portraits and then landscape shots to really give a full spectrum picture of what life in America was like. Birmingham Steel Mill and Workers Houses, 1936. So we have these kind of row of tenement houses and then in the background you see this humongous steel mill factory. So it gives you a real sense of the quality of life of people in America during the Great Depression, during those, during those years, um, living in very, very small factory houses and then walking down the street to this huge factory. Also this, I, what I love about this photograph is, um, is the negative space you know, that's created and the kind of abstraction of these huge, industrial forms. Sidewalk in Vicksburg, Missouri, 1936. Um, so he, he photographed all walks of life, all people 
um, to really give as much of a spectrum of a representation of America as possible. Um, I really love the texture of this photograph and these three men um, in, in, their, in their kind of best attire, right, sitting outside of the barber shop. And then you have this other man in the car kind of looking off, not looking at them. So you get a sense of kind of racial tensions um, that are embedded in, a, in American culture. And then compare that with this photograph, uh, Minstrel Show Detail 1936. Um, and the kind of caricature that's represent, represented here in some of the, some of the, uh, the drawings of these people, right? Um, African-American culture, kind of, um, the minstrel show, meaning that it's a blackface show. And so documenting this, you know, and this is not necessarily something that the Department of Agriculture of the U.S. government is, um, is interested in seeing, but it's something that is really important to see because it does give an indication of uh, the, tr the true essence of American culture. And so I think he had a tremendous amount of foresight in, in documenting um, America in, in a, with a kind of like raw, through raw lens, you know. The next photographer I wanna talk about is Robert Frank, 1924, and he died in 2019. And Robert Frank is, uh, is Swiss, and um, he was awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship. So he did some work with a commercial photographer in Switzerland, and then, but really, his they could the the photographer set him up with another artist, a, a photographer who was an artist, and Robert Frank really um, became interested in photography as an art form, and then uh, was awarded this Guggenheim Fellowship. Um, and Guggenheim Fellowships, I think I've mentioned them a couple times. Diane Arbus had one as well. Um, some of the other artists that we've been talking about were awarded Guggenheim Fellowships. And it's uh, just a, a very generous amount of money and time to devote to a uh, piece of scholarship that is um, artistically inclined. So there's many artists throughout history have received Guggenheims and they're usually some of the most important and prominent figures um, in the art world. So Robert Frank's Guggenheim Fellowship was to travel across to America. So he traveled across the Atlantic with his family to document post-war America. So this is in the 1950s and he took two years and numerous road trips across America to document America. And he was greatly influenced by Walker Evans and um, was really inspired by the monograph American photographs. And so created his own series or body of work that was in conversation with American photographs. And this uh, body works called the Americans. So post-war U.S. was really consumed with represent, representing Amer you know, Americans were really consumed with this idea of American exceptionalism because we had won the war, and um, now we're in kind of a boom. This is like the the boom of American culture and, and suburban culture, and this and this idea of American exceptionalism. Um, but what Robert Frank does is he, it, just like Walker Evans had done, he goes to document a kind of real America um, underneath the facade or the image that Americans want to portray about themselves or believe about themselves in their culture, that really underneath that he's, he ends up revealing a certain things about um, an economic divide and a racial divide, class divide. So he's here is using a high speed film. So this is, um, basically which allows you to take photographs more quickly. And so because of that, he ends up shooting a ton of photographs over 28,000 photographs. And then 83 of those images that he took end up in the, in the publication or the book, um, The Americans. And it was published in Paris and then later published in America. But um, I think it was a bit, a bit of a scandalous book when it was published. So here we have Parade Hoboken, New Jersey, 1955. And the way that the, the monograph, the way that, this, that his book is published, there are structured is that there are four different sections and um, each one kind of begins with this kind of flag. So there's this grounding image of a flag and he ends up using flags um, at, it, th throughout many of his photographs. He's, he's attracted to flags and will photograph flags, but it's not just the flag. So the flag kind of um, is, the, is, the, is the symbol here, but then we also have these figures in the background and we see, you know, through this window, the, the expression on this woman's face as she's looking out somehow um, is a, it, it tells something about the character through the characters that he's, that he's captured on film. 
Trolley, New Orleans, 1955. This is probably one of the most moving photographs in the series, at least to me, because we have a segregated trolley or bus. Um, and it's really the way that somehow in this moment he's captured this man's agony. Um, you know, as you know, here we have, um, this is before the 60s. So before voting rights and before um, the civil rights movement of the 60s. And so um, I think you, you can really see, and we're living, you know, post Jim, you know, we're living in the Jim Crow era here and we have this woman's face and you can, the, just the look on her face, the children in between is a central, the central kind of figures, but then it's really that man's face and the expression on his face somehow becomes so symbolic of a kind of longing for equality and dignity um, that African-Americans, um, that pushed African Americans to, you know, really um, get out in the streets and and demand change, um, and you know, we're, we're met with violence, obviously, as we know. Charleston, South Carolina, 1955. Um, so this says something about race, but it also says something about class. But all it is is a very simple portrait of this baby and this woman who is her, you know, nanny perhaps. He photographed flags, restaurants, people of all walks of life, and the automobile, um, which some, uh, all become really symbolic of uh, American culture. And here we have covered car, Long Beach, California, 1956. And I'd like to look at this photograph for a little while. And then let's look at this photograph, which is car accident, US 66, between Winslow and Flagstaff, Arizona. So here we have a reverence for car culture. We have this vehicle, we can't see it. It's being hidden, it's being covered. Um, but you can tell like the, just the, the, we can almost feel the, the material that this car is covered with. And so there must be a luxury vehicle underneath that car, something that is like very um, cared for and, and loved, right? And then here we have a similar kind of covering and, and a similar composition, but we have the other side of car culture also. So we have um, the kind of love and admiration for luxury vehicles. And then we also have uh, the death toll from car accidents. And so you have this body who's now covered. And so we have this formal relationship between these two photographs of the, the covering over over a body. And so we have it over the body of a vehicle and then the body of a victim. And also you can see the background. It really tells a story of, um, of uh, you know, economic, um, a kind of, you know, we have a, this is Long Beach, California, and there's, and then this is in some, you know, wherever it is, rural America. So you have this like diversity of uh, economic situations, obviously across America too. So while we want to maybe represent ourselves as, as embodying a kind of exceptionalism, there also is like great disparity. Next artist is Carrie Mae Weems, 1953. So all of these, th these series kind of, we have a bit of, with our last lecture, we're talking about sexuality and, and gender representation and the kind of um, pushing for um, a truer or more realistic representation of, um, of LGBTQ bodies. And then here we're th talking a, a, a bit a bit more um, critically about race and how photographers have um, used strategies of representation about race to talk about, uh, to, to address race, racial issues and address racism. So Carrie Mae Weems is one of the most influential contemporary artists, I believe, working across, and she works across all media. She makes video and she also does fabric textiles and things. Um, but we're really gonna look at some of her photographic series. Um, and her work is, it, she's, you know, she's a black artist, um, but she really investigates family and cultural identity in ways that kind of transcend just to look at, you know, she's not really so focused on race. She's more focused on family. She's more focused on um, domestic relationships and she's focused on cultural identity. Although the first series we'll look at, which is Ain't Jokin' speaks, you know, specifically about racial stereotypes. So just a little bit of a biography. She was born in 1953 in Portland, Oregon. And she was engaged in dance and theater at an early age. Um, in 1981, she received her, so, uh, you know, she's um, almost 30. She receives her BFA from CalArts, and that's when she begins her career as a fine artist. 
So this is the first series, Ain't Joke in 1987 to 1988. And she's constructing these photographs and, and she's pairing it with text that directly, uh, that is meant to shock us and directly addresses uh, racial stereotypes and racism. These are really confrontational, I find, but really effective in confronting the viewer's own stereotypes or own embedded or ingrained racism and forces us to deal with it and reckon with it and, and look at it. And she uses a strategy of uh, color, right, to talk about color. Um, so there's a formal strategy here. She's using black and white photographs, I think, really um, strategically, and then she's introducing color as well. And here again, we have text and the photographic image, which really points to how we use language and how important language is. One of her most famous series is the Kitchen Table series from 1990. And I apologize for the kind of artifacts of the scan. I, I scan these from a book. And so we have these like rainbow lines on top of these images, but they are really beautiful um, platinum prints and they're medium format platinum prints. Um, and what she's done with the Kitchen Table series is she used her own domestic space and constructed these kind of, kind of fictional narrative about a couple. Um, and you can see within, so you see a kind of, uh, not conflict, but a bit of friction um, between, and it's really about um, relationships. It's about family relationships and family dynamics. And she's really thinking about um, womanhood and she's thinking about women. She's thinking about herself. And so she's photographed herself. We have a singular light source. So it's a very simple setup. Um, and then she's constructing these scenes to then tell a story about domestic life. And we have a kind of tenderness here, uh, friendship, right? With these three photographs, but also perhaps conflict and they're discussing conflict. I can imagine them talking about their marriages or, or trying to um, work through whatever those conflicts are as you know, groups of friends do when they get together at night and over beer. Here's a tender moment between maybe a sister and her brushing her hair and then her and her daughter. This is her daughter. She had one daughter, Faith. Um, and teaching her femininity, right? Teaching, and, and, and we have this mirror and they're looking in the mirror. And so we get an intimate look into her personal life. Even though these are constructed photographs and constructed scenes, um, we're really centered around the kitchen table, which is the kind of object of conversation. It becomes a, the, the place of conversation, the kitchen table. It's a place of sharing and it's a place of kind of um, intermittent intimate interactions between family. Um, and so she's cleverly used that as a central element to then tie all of these different moments together to give us a view into her world. But then to also, I think, um, even though she's not necessarily addressing race here, she is in the early 90s when, you know, the world, even till still today, we know that racism is still very much prevalent in, in our culture, um, that you know, she's, she's representing herself in a particular way to show a sense of um, normalcy and relatability um, in face of other images, right? We go back to that, the, the, the tradition of the, the, that minstrel show uh, image from Walker Evans, right? And we can see, and we, we, we know what the history, we know what, um, how that image has perpetuated itself and those stereotypes have perpetuated themselves. So an artist of color is uh, representing themselves in a different way to the general public in order to change the culture, in order to change our perspective, in order to get rid of those stereotypes. And um, this is a very powerful thing to do. Here's another one where she's just reading and she's teaching her daughter. And here she is, you know, this is the artist. And again, that confrontational gaze, but it's inviting. Right now you're at the kitchen table with her. 
um, and you're being invited in. And so it's really generous, um, but also there's just such strength, again, that's being represented here as a self-portrait. This series is from here, I saw what happened and cried 1995 to 1996. So Carrie Mae Weems, um, has appropriated uh, photographs taken of slaves. And then she's she has this kind of red hue. So she's um, printing them with a filter, this red filter over them. And so this gives a real sense of um, urgency or danger. At least that's how it's, that's how I, what's communicated to me by having that filter of red um, because red is a really powerful color. Uh, and then she has this text overlaid. And so she's, um, so we can read the text ourselves, each kind of quietly. This image was on the cover of Art in America. Um, I saw when I was doing a bit of research today about these photographs. So these photographs were taken um, without the purest of intentions. <laughs> to, in this case, an anthropological debate. So a way to document bodies um, in a really kind of vulgar and perverse way, obviously, if these are slaves, images of slaves, but she's, she's giving the dignity and humanity back to them. And then she is speaking directly to the person in the image. So it's not just a piece of scientific data that these photographs were taken to be, uh, potentially. But instead, now she's giving the humanity back and we're really looking at the person. And we can really, again, the, the title, from here, I saw what happened and cried. So there's a real sense of, um, of pain in dealing with the, the past and dealing with this, this, the legacy of racism in America. This might be a, a soldier, Civil War soldier, perhaps. And the last artist is Latoya Ruby Frazier. Uh, Latoya Ruby Frazier was uh, taught by Carrie Mae Weems at Syracuse University. Um, where she got her MFA. So Carrie Mae Weems was her uh, mentor. And she is a rising art star. I saw her work at the Whitney Biennial in I think 2011 maybe, because that's where the one series is that I recognize, Braddock Hospital, um, campaign for Braddock Hospital. And she's also, uh, she was, I, I also saw some of her work um, in the Venice Biennale in 2015. So her work is, um, also being exhibited internationally. And uh, she received her BFA from Edinburgh University of Pennsylvania. She's from Braddock, Pennsylvania. And, um, and then again, her MFA from Syracuse University. Uh, she's also been included at MoMA PS1 and the New Museum and all the kind of like major contemporary art museums. So two of her really influential bodies of work are Notions of Family, which is an, uh, a, a long running series that that she did from 2001 to 2014, and then campaign for Braddock Hospital, which is the one that I saw at the Whitney Biennial in 2011. So again, we have a kind of photojournalistic impulse, but it is um, being paired with a really personal exploration. And so pairing the two, um, photojournalism with uh, personal narrative, um, allows us an, an, an insight and a, there's a kind of truth that gets portrayed rather than uh, a some kind of um, rather than an agenda um, rather than we want to be sh we want to be showing the world with a particular kind of rose colored glasses and instead there's a sense of urgency in what she's showing as a problem that she sees in her community here this is fifth street tavern and the u PMC Braddock Hospital on Braddock Avenue, 2011. So this series of photographs, and they do their photojournalistic, they document the destruction of the community hospital. 
and Braddock, Pennsylvania is an area where there was a lot of steel milling going on. Um, it has a history of, of the steel industry, um, just like Pittsburgh and a lot of Western Pennsylvania. Uh, um, and so because the water supply has been contaminated, um, many of her community members are facing cancer and all sorts of other, uh, you know, diseases and ailments because of uh, the environmental impact of that industry. And so this campaign for Braddock Hospital is to, um, to use her photographs um, to, to represent her community, but also the need for this hospital. Because um, a lot of times poor communities um, end up losing. Um, and in this case, this is a huge loss for their community because not only are most of many of her community members sick, including her own grandmother and mother, um, but now there's no place for them to get well due to, you know, governmental budget cuts and things like that. This is part of that um, Notions of Family series. And this is a portrait, a self portrait. And so I think we have her mother in the background reflected in a mirror. And then we also have um, the Huxtables on her t-shirt. So we have a kind of representational black family that's inspirational in the eighties. Um, and we have a self portrait here. So she's wearing that um, and it's her, herself is portrayed her likeness, but then also her mother in the background looking at her. And then we have this pile of clothing. So we get a sense of the kind of economic situation that, they, that they're in. Huxable's mom and me, 2009. This is grandma, Ruby and me. Um, and perhaps she's reflected somewhere. Her, maybe her image is reflected somewhere in this photograph. I can't tell, but um, maybe that's her little sister and her grandmother and they're in the living room. And there's a lot of cultural artifacts around and there's like a sense of pride here, um, but also her grandmother's face is um, kind of questioning. And so she's, she's using representations of her family to speak about, uh, you know, larger kind of cultural representations. Self-portrait in Gramps Pajamas, 2009. Again, it's really, a, it's really speaking about access and class and, and money and, and, um, and the divide, the kind of racial and class divide that exists in America. So I'm not sure where, what building she's in here, but we can get a sense of the kind of economic depravity that her community is in. And so she portrays this through her photographs with a real, um, you know, again, a kind of raw, truthful lens. Okay, so those are our photographs this week.